Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar on managing behaviour and personality change. Um, the host today are myself, Helen, I'm Director of Policy and Services at Brains Trust and I'm delighted to have Jodie along too. Jodie is our support specialist who usually covers the uh, Midlands but during coronavirus when we furloughed some of the support team, Jodie and I are basically supporting everybody between us and it's been great working together. Um, this is one of a series of webinars uh, from within Brains Trust. We've rolled out webinars on uh, how to deal with the overwhelm, living with uncertainty, how to manage fatigue. Um, and we will be repeating these in the months ahead, but also we're delighted to be expanding our web webinar program. And we've got experts from outside who are also going to be joining um, this 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 program so we've got webinars coming up on how to manage seizures talking about uh, neuroimaging also diet just different aspects of diet including the ketogenic diet that's just um, some ideas of the things that we've got coming up and if there's anything you would like a webinar on then just email Jodie or I you'll find the emails at the end of this presentation to let us know so I think of all the webinars we've been rolling out, managing and behaviour and personality change, I think for us is the most challenging. And I think, you know, you as patients and caregivers and possibly healthcare professionals, if you're listening in, I think there's nothing as disempowering as when you're, you know, faced with somebody who's in real distress because they're not able to manage their behaviour and personality change. And I think the distress for me comes from the fact that the the, the person knows that this behavior isn't how they want to be as a person um, and it's it's so hard so I think you know today this isn't about providing a silver bullet there are none just as there are none for managing fatigue but this is about a focus on developing strategies so it's not about changing anyone it is about developing strategies to cope um, and as usual with these webinars, I will do the first half, which is about deepening our understanding of what we mean by behaviour and personality change, looking at the research that's out there, and there isn't much. Um, and then the second half are, is going to be Jody talking through some of the strategies that you could begin to explore and use and talk about uh, with your loved one. The other thing I would say is that, you know, this would normally be a three hour workshop, but obviously we're doing an hour on webinar. We think an hour is probably long enough for people to concentrate. Um, and when you join our live webinars, there will be uh, the opportunity to interact. You know, you can use the chat. You're invited to also participate and chat. Sometimes we actually get you doing some of the strategies. But today is going to be a bit drier than that. It's us, just Jody and I presenting the webinar. Um, and also, if you join the live webinars, there's also an opportunity for you to sign up for a coaching, a separate coaching session if the webinar has brought to the surface any of the challenges or problems that you're actually facing and you'd welcome more time uh, to talk about those. So all of our information production uh, goes through a very rigorous information standard process. Um, so it's co-produced with leading experts in the field, uh, clinicians, patients and caregivers. Okay, Jodie, I haven't got the arrow, so would you mind changing the slides for me? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, at this first uh, soundbite, I've known this man for 46 years and now I feel as, as I know nothing about him. It's one that was said to us a couple of years ago from a caregiver, and it's just stayed with me. Um, I think, you know, what makes this webinar, what makes all our webinars different from the wealth of information that is now out on the web is that we always make this relatable and meaningful for people living with a brain tumor. And I think the difference when you're diagnosed with a brain tumor is that it strikes at your very identity. And depending on where your brain tumour is, that is going to impact on the way that you relate to the world and those around you. And we'll talk more about that later. But this quotation for me strikes at the very heart of what it means to be living with a brain tumour. So the aims then of this uh, webinar, we'd like you to leave that you feeling more confident about how to manage behaviour personality change and have a deeper understanding about why it happens and what it is. 
we'd like you to walk away feeling that you were more informed and engaged with your own personal situation, but also that you would know where to reach out for extra help if you feel you need it. We also want you to feel that you're, you're assured that you're doing the best you can to cope with behavior and personality change. Um, a quotation or a metaphor I'm using quite a lot at the moment, we're in coronavirus, is that it's almost like we're flying the plane while building it. You know, you're in uncharted territories, you don't know what the flight plan's gonna be like, um, you don't know what bits are gonna fall off next or what needs the next quick fix. So it very it is very much about being agile, about being nimble and being responsive, but also thinking about how you respond to the situations in front front of you. So also feeling comfortable and confident about exploring further options and knowing where to go um, for further help. So if we could go on to the next slide, Jody. thank you. So what do we mean when we talk about behaviour and personality change? Well, it's almost easier to say what behaviour and personality change isn't. It's not related to movement and physical sensations. So if you've got problems with balance, and coordination and numbness, that's not behaviour and personality change. Those are affected that, you know, the, the balance, coordination and numbness, these are affected by parts of the brain that control our motor functions. It also isn't depression and surprisingly isn't anxiety. Yes, these are changes, but they can, and they can also impact on the way someone living with a brain tumour behaves, but they wouldn't be on their own behaviour and personality change. They might be part of a much bigger picture. Um, so somebody might have changes, huge mood swings, which might lead to anxiety or depression, but in their totality, it's not just depression and anxiety. They're just part of the bigger jigsaw. And you may have heard two of the words cogn cognition or cognitive deficit being used. And this refers to a loss of cognitive ability. So, for example, a loss in our ability to make a reasoned judgment or not being able to do more than one thing at a time or maybe being overwhelmed if you've got lots of senses being, you know, having demands made on them. You could be in a busy room where there's lots of noise. Um, it's a blur of people and it's really hard to process the information that's going on around you. So it is pervasive. You know, behavior and personality change impacts in a variety of ways all the things that enable us to be who we are. And I think that's what sets this apart when you're living with a brain tumor from, say, another cancer diagnosis. Um, so it will impact on our physical way of living. So we might have reduced energy levels. We might have diminished strength or difficulty sleeping. In our social aspects, there could be changes in our roles or relationships. You might find that you've got altered responsibilities within the family. If, for example, you're no longer working, you may find that you're at home and your partner is going out to work and there is more expectation of you because you're at home all day. So that's a change in role. You um, might have from the concentrative, you can't process info, you get easily overwhelmed or easily distracted. You, you have an inability to understand new information. And those daily tasks that you've been doing for years that you didn't think anything about, like making the bed in the morning, you might go back in the evening and realized you'd forgotten to make the bed. So what we call those typical activities of daily living suddenly are more difficult to do, things that you've taken in your stride. And the emotional too, you might have changes in mood, reduced feelings of self-esteem or confidence, and also a loss of sense of control about your daily life and fears or anxiety about the uncertainty that the future is going to bring. And then spiritual, you know, questioning your purpose. So feelings of why me related to the diagnosis. All of these things come into play with behavior and personality change. So it's what we call multifactorial. You know, there, there are a lot of factors at play with this. Um, if you want to find out more about how it manifests itself, um, how it's different, then please look at our booklet, Beha Behavior and Personality Change. It's a fabulous resource. And this is what this webinar is based on. And we're happy to send you a hard copy or you can download one from the website um, and there'll be links at the end. So 
Je uh, Jody, could we go to the next slide? Thank you. So this is a slide that everybody finds useful uh, and it shows you the different areas of the brain and how it, depending on where your brain tumour is sighted, um, how it impacts on you. So for example, your frontal lobe, that tends to be where um, our brain filters what is appropriate behaviour. And that's where our inhibitions come, come from. So, you know, we know how, what is appropriate behavior in society. For, so for somebody that might have um, a brain tumor in their frontal lobe, their behavior might change in such a way that suddenly they're disinhibited. So they might say inappropriate things to people, or, you know, they might behave in an inappropriate way, like not being aware that it's right to be closed all the time. Um, so the reasoning can be affected and your emotional traits, also problem solving, that tends, that tends to be impacted. So, you know, disinhibited behaviours or actions that often seem tactless or rude or can even be interpreted as being offensive. And that they occur when people don't follow the social rules. Then they make poor assessments about risk too. So that would, they might do things that would put themselves or others at risk. And these behaviours, of course, can place enormous strain on families and their caregivers, but also the patient, because often they will realize after the event that what they did was inappropriate. Um, and I, you know, I use the example of a lovely gentleman who posted something completely inappropriate on Facebook. Now the normal reaction would be to delete it. It was deleted, but Jane, one of our support specialists just picked up the phone to him and he was horrified at what he'd done. He knew he shouldn't have done it. And then, you know, he talked for a long time with Jane about how because of his behavior and he knows how he behaves inappropriately at times, his world had become so small because he'd stopped going out. So all the things that were the mortar that made his heart sing, like going to the golf club, meeting his mates, he'd stop doing. So we, we were able to support him and his, his wife through that. Temporal lobe, you know, behavior, memory, understanding language. Um, that's also to do with timing, things like that, particularly with memory. Um, and then your parietal lobe, that is to do with, you know, your location, your ability to map, your, map the journeys you're going on, remembering journeys that you've been on. And your occipital lobe will be vision and color. So if you get, you know, if you've got a tumor in your occipital lobe, chances are you'll have some visual um, dis, um, disturbances or maybe your sense of perspective. So things seem, might seem foreshortened or lengthened. And then your brainstem, that's the motor house of your body. So, you know, if some people are diagnosed with a brain tumor on their brainstem, it could be tiny tiniest tumor but if it's malignant and it's inoperable then you know they're looking at something that could be quite life limiting and that's really affects your breathing your heart rate all the things that drive that drive our bodies and make them work and then your cerebellum it's your balance and your coordination so you you know like my daughter's brain tumor was across the parietal the occipital and the temporal lobe so it would impact on those three areas. So her short-term memory is not great. She finds it really hard to navigate, even if it's a journey that she does regularly. Um, she gets lost, so she has to have markers in their staging posts in her journey. So that's one of the strategies she uses. And also lots of visual um, disturbances, so it's a bit like a migraine. Um, so you can see why it's very, very complex. And, you know, some of you just seeing this, knowing where your brain tumor is in your brain, sometimes just knowing this helps you understand why the changes have happened to your behavior and your personality, because that's the point at which you can depersonalize it. And you can understand that actually it's not you or your, you know, it, it's, it's not you, it's your brain tumor that's making you behave this way. And sometimes that's helpful for caregivers too, to understand that actually it's not their loved one that's behaving in this way, but it's the brain tumor that's making them behave um, this way. So let's go to the next slide now with the two themes. So in all our years of working with the brain tumor community, We've done uh, surveys run out on social media. We've had, you know, face-to-face -face daily interactions. Um, and the fundamental theme that underpins all of this is our relationships. 
be it with a close person, so your main caregiver, a healthcare professional, or with the patient themselves. And when illness strikes, a number of structural and emotional skews follow. Our belief systems are challenged. So all of those threads of our lives that we've spent many, many years weaving together, where we, you know, we felt we were comfortable with ourselves, we knew what was happening, um, suddenly they've been torn apart and our roles are upended, our identities shift. And with a brain tumour diagnosis, again, what sets it apart from other diagnoses is that this can be a recurring pattern. It doesn't just happen once at diagnosis. It keeps happening along the disease trajectory. So, you know, you have your, you get your diagnosis, you then have surgery. Well, that's a brain injury and that can impact on the way we behave, our personality um, and behavior as well. You then have chemotherapy and radiotherapy in some instances for some tumors. That too leaves a legacy, leaves a footprint, which can change your behavior and personality change. You might then get to a point where if you've got a high grade glioma, you're at recurrence and that too can begin to take it take its toll so it doesn't just happen once and i think sometimes people aren't aware of that and i think the other key theme that came up is why aren't we receiving support guidance and information from our clinical team so if we could have the next slide thanks jody so for those of you that have attended our other webinar on fatigue you'll recognize this this is a piece of work called the concordance work that came out of cambridge um, adam brooks and cambridge university and they realized that there was a discordance between what doctors wanted to talk about and what um, the patients and caregivers wanted to talk about when they were having their consultations about their brain tumors so they ran a survey um, it was a questionnaire that was run same questionnaire run across both groups um, and the blue lines represent the clinician's responses and the red lines represent the patient's responses. You don't really need to bother too much about the words underneath, but if you look at the two tall red spikes, the two things that patients and their caregivers wanted to talk about most were future uncertainty and fatigue. And the things that the clinicians wanted to talk about were visual disorder, it's this little cluster in the middle, motor dysfunction, communication deficit, headaches and seizures. Now, the reason a lot of clinicians go into medicine is because they want to be able to fix people. They want to be able to cure, you know, a patient comes, with, comes to them with a problem and they want to be able to have the answer. The problem with behavior and personality change, there is no script you can write. There's no magic pill you can give. Um, so visual disorder, you can refer to a neuro-ophthalmologist. Motor dysfunction, you can refer to a um, physiotherapist. Communication deficit, speech and language therapist. Headaches, easy to either refer to a pain clinic or prescribe some medication. The same with seizures. You know, you can you can write a script for anti-epileptic medication. So it's very challenging for a clinician when they're faced with people in distress who really don't know what to do about managing their behavior and personality change because it's not something you can write a prescription for. It's not something you can necessarily refer on onto. Um, and so there is a lack really not of understanding because i think you'd have great empathy but knowing where to go with managing behavior and personality change um, it brings you know a threat to way of life there's a lack of control with behavior the impact of it on relationships which lead then to systemic problems leading to isolation and also access to support. Where, where do you go to support? It's really, really hard. And it's compounded by the fact that less than 50% of uh, neuro multidisciplinary team clinics in the UK have access to neuropsychological services. So it is a priority for patients and caregivers. You have told us it is, and that was also reinforced by the top 10 uncertainties of the James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership for Neuro-Oncology. So abstract things like fatigue, like living with uncertainty, behavior and personality change, they tend to get marginalized by the people that we would typically go to to ask for help. So why is it such a challenge? If we go, thank you. Well, Firstly, there is no one definition 
for what do we mean by behavior and personality change. But the definitions we do have inextricably link behavior and personality together. We know too that the symptoms cover a huge spectrum. At one end, you might have apathy and indifference. So somebody, you know, wakes up in the morning, but it just can't be bothered to get out of bed. They don't feel there's anything to get out of bed for. They have no sense of purpose. Um, they're just living in a vacuum and they feel pretty numb about the whole thing. Or at the other end, you might have egocentrism. So, you know, it's all about me. I'm the most important thing here. Um, and also disinhibition, which we've talked about, and aggression if the tumor's in the frontal lobe. We also don't know how common the problem is. It's difficult to determine because we have so much anecdotal evidence, but there are no validated measurement tools, looking at the last bullet point, that actually measure um, behavior and personality change. We don't have a proper standardized measurement tool to assess behavior and personality change. So it is all anecdotal and it's very hard when you've only got anecdotal evidence um, to get funding to do some sort of research in this area. We don't know too whether it's tumor effect, whether it's treatment effect, or whether it might be the impact, you know, so you're suffering from depression uh, because of the brain tumor. Um, or it could be a combination of all three. And, you know, Jodie and I will know from our own experience that sometimes people already have a history of mental health issues who are then diagnosed with a brain tumor. So it just layers on the hardship and the challenges. Um, so, you know, there might be people with existing mental health problems that, that, that come to this table as well, which is very sad. Also, the uncertain trajectory. It's insidious over time or it can happen very quickly within weeks. Um, if it's insidious over the time, often as a caregiver, you don't really notice the changes until you stop one day and think back how things were three months or six months ago. And sometimes patients are aware that there is a change, but they're also very good at creating a workaround. So they, they're very good at hiding things um, from their families. So you don't always notice it. Or, you know, it might happen very, very quickly within a few weeks, um, depending on where the tumour is, what the growth of the tumour is like. Um, and you'll know those when the change happens very quickly, you're more likely to notice it. OK, so what happens then? What's what's the cycle that we get into? Well, it's a cycle of reaction. You know, uh, you start off at point nine and then you might have an incident that comes because of loss of control, you've lost your temper, you've become violent, and that obviously makes you feel vulnerable and less confident about how to behave in the future. So you never bounce back to where you were. And then next time it happens, you'll dip even lower. And so your ability to cope, your confidence, your assurance about whether you're doing the things that you should be doing just becomes diminished over time. So we know from talking to you that we're not there yet with managing behavior and personality change. Patients experience a loss of relational closeness and become socially inactive. They find it's easier to close the door on the world um, and not engage with people because of the uncertainty of how they're going to behave. They're bothered by the changes about thinking about the future uncertainty um, they feel guilty by the distortion of family life, which they feel they've caused and the impact that this is having. And caregivers too have a very different discourse and it can lead to a very poor quality of time, um, quality of life at a time when, you know, they're having to be strong, they're having to be enabler for others. Often they're having to be the mortar for the family, holding things together for the children as well. They have to be secure with uncertainty they have to be open with not knowing, you know, just accept that actually we don't know how today's going to pan out. You might have something planned, but then suddenly at the last minute, you might have to pick up the phone and say, sorry, we're not going to make it today. Things just aren't in the good place for us right now. They may have to take risks, you know, sometimes for their own sanity, they might need to just leave the care of the patient and go out for a walk just to protect themselves and take some space out, time out. And they also have to ensure that their inner dialogue is constructive. And very often at this point, caregivers suppress their own needs to meet the needs of their loved one. So let's look at how this might play out 
um, Andy. <laughs> Some of you will have met Andy before. We tend to use him a lot because he really does represent the you know real people that we support. So Andy's 42. He has three children, and he's been diagnosed with a low-grade glioma. So um, he knows that his immediate to midterm future is secure, but the longer term is probably not, um, because low-grade brain tumours always transfer, transform to a higher grade as, as the years go on. And he knows this. So because he's had seizures, he's lost his driving licence. He's um, a joiner. So he works in carpentry and he was his own, you know, he was, he, he was self-employed. He'd go out, he'd drive out to houses, give quotes, and then if the successful would get the work and do the job, but he can no longer drive. So he's now had to become employed and that already doesn't sit comfortably with him because he's his own man. He likes to be in control and now he's not. He's also of the school where he feels a proper man looks after his family, he pays his own way and doesn't ask for help. Um, so he's feeling out of control. He's feeling that he's hand, had to hand over too much ownership to other people and that not only is he in service to other people, but he's also in service to his brain tumour, that this is now controlling him. So he's feeling overwhelmed. And the only way he can cope is by being highly critical, uh, which of course causes tensions at home. He's critical of his children. He's critical of his wife and he flashes off and gets angry. So the emotions that he feels are a huge range from anxiety and stress to guilt, angry a lot of the time. And when he's angry, he tries to suppress it because he knows it's not the right way to behave. And then he feels that he should be able to sort this out for himself. And he won't talk about it with anybody. So he's getting increasingly isolated. He doesn't think there's any point in going to see the GP. They're overwhelmed. And anyway, they only get, um, to, he'd only have 10 minutes with him and the how can you fix somebody in, in 10 minutes? It's up to him to do it. And these manifest themselves in physical symptoms. So he has increased heart rate. Um, his breathing is faster. He has muscle tension because he's stressed, but he also has muscle tension from his seizures, which tend to affect the left side of his body. And that leads to poor sleep, which means that he's cognitively impaired. He's not able to make the judgments, the reason judgments um, that he would normally have made in the past. So his reaction to this is to push through, to man up, drinks lots of Red Bull, which of course means then that he makes more, more mistakes. So he has to repeat work. Um, he starts to miss shifts. So he's getting increasingly isolated from his partner and his work because the bottom line is he's just not coping. So I'm going to hand over to Jodie now. It sounds like I've painted a very, very black picture. Uh, but it's not all it's not all bad. And Jodie's going to talk us through how you can break this cycle that Andy's got in to. And very often it's very simple things that you can do to mitigate. And that's what the next half is about. So over to you, Jodie. Thank you, Helen. Um, so as Helen said, in the next section, um, we're going to talk about some strategies that might help when um, managing behaviour and personality change. So um, I just wanted to note that these strategies are designed to support both patients and caregivers as well. Okay, so we saw in the previous example um, we just shared with Andy, how the situation can affect our thoughts, emotions, actions and symptoms. So we're now going to look at how by changing the situation, you can make positive changes to the other elements as well. So in the new example that you can see on the screen, and with the help of some of the strategies that I'm going to talk about shortly, you can change the situation to one of adapting and compromise. This will then change the thoughts to those of being able to examine, share, accept and depersonalise which in hand can impact the emotions to those of acceptance, understanding, the ability to let it go and to be unashamed. The symptoms will be to be able to relax, re-energise, feel more resilient and be able to implement self-care. And the actions which can help this are those of creating space, being able to respond to situations, move on, be kind to yourself and seek help. So now we're going to revisit Andy and see how these changes have had a positive outcome for him. 
sometimes to be able to implement change, there may often be a moment that can trigger this change. For Andy, his trigger was that he got angry towards his children. He felt out of control and it frightened him. As a result of this, he spoke to his wife who reflected back to him his behaviour over the past few months. By having this conversation and this moment, it created a shift that meant she became part of his team and they were able to work on things together. His wife reached out to us for support, so we became part of their team as well. As a result of this, Andy no longer felt isolated and his wife felt supported as well. So you can see in this new example that by changing the situation, the rest followed. So Andy's thoughts were still that a proper man looked after his family, but he is able to do this now by asking for help and support. He manages his moods by developing strategies that help him and he develops an understanding of the changes he is experiencing. <coughs> his emotions have changed to those of acceptance, having a motivation for change, and he feels supported and that he is able to express how he is feeling. His ability to sleep has improved as a result of this, which means his concentration levels have improved and he has seen physical improvements as well with regards to his blood pressure, heart rate, hormonal levels and digestive function. The actions he's undertaken to help with this is that he talks to his boss about his shift patterns, talks to his wife about how he is feeling and learns to pace himself and take time to do the things he enjoys. Okay, so now we have seen how things can change. Um, I'm just going to look at some strategies that you can try to help with this. So the first one we're going to look at and what you can see on the screen is about keeping a mood journal. So a mood journal is a way for you to be able to measure your mood to help you manage it. There's lots of different mood charts and journals available online, so you can find one that works for you. Here on the screen is an example of one that you can download from our website, which is also included um, in our Behaviour and Personality Change resource as well. So mood journals can be invaluable because they can help you track changes, examine patterns of emotions experienced, help you to identify triggers and situations and events that cause them, and they can help you to identify what certain influences may be, both external and internal. So external factors include who, what, where and how. And internal factors can include thoughts, memories, fantasies and physical factors. So by keeping a mood journal and being equipped with this information, you can then have concrete data which can help you to spark change, improve habits through the introduction of more productive coping techniques. Okay. So um, I just want to take a moment to make a note that at the moment there is currently little evidence to suggest that drug treatment will improve behaviour and personality change in people living with a brain tumour diagnosis. It's recommended that if you or a loved one are experiencing these changes then you should speak to your clinical team or GP about whether you are able to get um, a neuropsychiatry or neuropsychology assessment. So now we have looked at how you can measure behaviours, we're going to talk about the practical side of developing strategies. So in our resources and workshops, we use the principle of marginal gains. As, as mentioned, this webinar and our face-to-face -face workshops work well with our physical resource, so do familiarise yourself with it. It's available to download from our website or we can post you a copy if you send us an email. So the story behind marginal gains is that in 2010, Dave Railsford was brought in as the new general manager and performance director for Team Sky, Great Britain's professional cycling team. No British cyclist had ever won the Tour de France, but that is what he was asked to do. His approach was simple. Railsford believed in a concept that he referred to as the aggregation of marginal gains. So as with Team Sky, there is no magic wand or silver bullet that will spirit away the challenges of behaviour and personality change. It's easy to overestimate the importance of one defining moment and underestimate the value of making better decisions on a daily basis. Almost every habit that you have, good or bad, 
is the result of many small decisions. So if you improve every area related to behaviour and personality change by just 1%, then the small gains will add up to a remarkable improvement. You can start by optimising the obvious things, such as self-help strategies, maybe one or two of them, then search for 1% improvements in tiny areas that are not so obvious or hard to define. So this webinar, some of the ideas we'll talk about along with the resource, is um, the aim is to help you search, analyse, deal with and manage your 1% improvements everywhere. So I just briefly mentioned about self-help strategies. Um, you can find more information about some ideas um, of self-care and self-help strategies by looking at our know-hows. Um, these are available to download on our website and there'll be a link to these at the end of the webinar. And there's also lots of um, ideas for this in the resources as well. So some ideas of self-care strategies can include relaxation, mindfulness, pleasurable activities, acceptance, exercise and rest and diet. So when thinking about this, take some time to look through each of these strategies and see how you can build them into your daily routine. And when keeping your mood journal, bring them into that as external factors so you can measure how you feel on certain days when you activate certain self-care strategies. It won't be a quick fix, but have a think back to marginal gains and the 1% improvements. So this next section, and we'll be looking at some more practical strategies that you can put into place when living with behaviour and personality change as both a patient and a caregiver. So there's more information about this um, from page 30 of our resource. So these next steps incorporate some of the strategies that we've mentioned and also underpin all of the strategies mentioned in the resource as well. So looking at the key messages, so the first, first one is about meeting your own needs. So you can do this through some of the self-care strategies that we have discussed as well. But essentially, have a think about what do you need, what is important to you, and who's in your team, who can help you with that. You may find if you're thinking about this with, um, between a patient and a caregiver, you may have differences in what you each need. So incorporate that into it as well. So understanding and communication. Following a brain tumour diagnosis and treatment, there may be a number of symptoms that a patient may experience that may, may find communication with others a challenge. This could include verbal communication, understanding language, memory and fatigue. Some of these symptoms may require specialist intervention, such as speech and language therapy, and occupational therapy support. So again, think back to who or what can help. And if you need um, any more information, you can get in touch with us and we can see um, how we can help you with that as well. So keeping a mood journal can also help to identify if any of these symptoms are the cause of changes in mood. Again, they each require individual management and work together to find what works for you to help improve communication and understanding. Okay, planning and be prepared. So this can come in two parts. Firstly, by analysing and putting in strategies and measures to help. And again, you can do this by completing the mood journal or keeping a record, which is keep a key part of this so you can identify any patterns of behaviour. To help with um, any sudden shifts in behaviour, you can take a look at some of the questions that you can find on page 32 of our resource. So I'm just going to go through a quick short overview of what these cover. So you can start off by defining the problem, looking at the situation and considering the circumstances and then assessing the actions and behaviour. Again, this can be done between a patient and caregiver, or even a healthcare professional or a charity representative, or you can do it alone. So the next step after you've followed these steps is putting in place some self-activation strategies as discussed earlier. So the next strategy um, to look at is breaking the cycle of guilt. 
Guilt is an emotion that many of us experience when living with a brain tumour diagnosis, both as a patient and a caregiver. Often there can be different types of guilt, and this may be a cause of conflict, and it's a natural reaction to have when we are faced with trauma. There are two types of guilt. The first one is healthy and appropriate, um, for example, when you eat lots of chocolate. It serves a purpose in trying to help redirect our moral or behavioural compass. Your brain is telling you that what you did is wrong. The second type of guilt does not serve a purpose. This guilt happens when you've done nothing wrong. There's nothing to feel guilty about, yet we still do. This is known as unhealthy or inappropriate guilt because it serves no purpose. This is the type of guilt that can come, come with being a caregiver, but also a patient as well. So some tips in how you can help break this cycle of guilt are to recognise that your struggle is valid, realise you are resilient, act on it, think, what am I going to do about this? Know your strengths, think who can help, where is your sanctuary, be kind to yourself and go back to your core values. Um, and you can find more detail about these um, on page 39 of our um, Behaviour and Personality Change resource. So just to finish my section, here's just a reminder of safety netting and what to do if you're in a crisis and feel like your life might, might be in danger. So you can incorporate this um, when planning. OK, so um, if you are in a crisis, call 999. Remove yourself from immediate danger, seek help and make it clear to that person that your, you or your loved one is very ill and confused. Thank you, Helen, back to you. Mute me, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Jodie. So yeah, it can seem hugely overwhelming, but I think just by starting to keep a mood journal, it will highlight what the triggers are. Sometimes it can be something as simple as having one too many glasses of wine, um, might be a low blood sugar moment, anything like that. And then once you've begun to identify it, just by having a conversation with each other when you're not in that place of heightened emotional distress, but when you're calm, you're through the storm, just sitting down and say, okay, how can we work together? to stop this happening. It can be something as simple as, as having an agreement, for example, that when one of you feels that things are unraveling around you, the other one will just leave them and give them some space. And yesterday when we ran this workshop, that was one of the things that came up in the chat column. People said, I just have an agreement with my flatmates that they go out and leave me, just give me some space. Um, usually it only takes half an hour. Sometimes even just moving to a different physical space can help. Um, so it really is about looking at the very simple things you can do and focusing on achieving mental health rather than treating mental health. And there are loads of apps out there to help you calm down, you know, headspace, things like that. So with minimal time and effort, you know, you can start taking note of the patterns that your lives are going through and adjust accordingly. So some things to think about then. I think, you know, even just to ask yourself, what is it you're struggling with the most? And sometimes it might seem a big, one big overwhelming thing, but even that can be unpacked. Um, so, you know, okay, what particularly is it about that one thing that you're struggling with? Is there anything else? Is there anything else? And just keep asking yourself that question. Genty's talked about, you know, sometimes just making three tiny changes can make a huge shift, a huge transformation for you. But crucially, don't think you're in this alone. You know, there will, we've got a peer support program. We can line you up with other people that have been through this experience. Um, you can talk to us. And also, you know, we, if, you're, if you're just overwhelmed, we can also do some research around local services that might help as well. So thank you for joining this webinar. Here's the links. Um, you know, please download our know-hows on how to build a team around you, how to deal with the overwhelm, living with uncertainty. Look at the areas about uh, mindfulness and exercise because it's all about developing a really good quality of life. And it is possible for you to have your best possible day, no matter where you are on the trajectory of living with a brain tumour. And then, of course, all of our webinars you'll find on Eventbrite and you'll probably get emails from uh, 
Jodie as well telling you about them. So thank you for today. We're going to scoot off now because actually we've got in five minutes our regular Friday Brew with Brains Trust. We don't have any agenda, but anybody's welcome to join this every Friday at two o'clock on Zoom. Um, and we'd love to see you in that space and have a chat with you there too. So thank you. Jodie, any last words from you? No, I think that's covered everything. But um, if, you know, if there is anything else that we can do, do to support anybody, please do um, give us a call or send us an email as well. We're, we're here for you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.